everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ICMCP Engage webinar on the colors of cybersecurity. Let me show you our esteemed panelists. Here they are. Today, we have three cybersecurity professionals joining us. And as you can see, they are all adorned in the appropriate color for what they'll be representing today. <clears throat> Let me first uh, provide a very brief uh, introduction on my own, and then I will allow uh, these three ladies to introduce themselves. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we are joined by Sharon Burgess, Becky Seltzer, and Trupti Sheralka. So with that, um, I will allow each one of you to please take a moment and introduce yourselves, and then we'll jump back into the agenda. So Trupti, allow me to start with you, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, my name is Trupti, and I have been in product security space for last 15 years. And trust me, guys, I have been, I have been wearing every color that you can think about. I have been a pen tester, uh, a blue team member, uh, and uh, with the help of security innovation, I have recently implemented purple teaming at Illimio. So that's about me. Very exciting. Uh, Becky, if you please. My name is Becky Selzer. I've worked in cybersecurity for about 16 years now, started in the intelligence community. And in the last seven years, I've been at United Airlines doing a variety of roles from application security, vulnerability management, incident response, threat intelligence, and most recently, aviation cybersecurity. So looking at securing all of the computer systems on the aircraft and the supporting ground systems, and also cybersecurity awareness. So I've gotten to do a little bit of everything here. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you, Becky. And Sharon, if you please. And you're muted. <laughs> I, was being, I was about to be amazing. Um, so my name is Sharon Burgess. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at BCD Travel. And uh, my role is bringing the respective blue and red teams together to drive what we need to for our program overall uh, within our company. I've been in security for whew, a long time, 15 years, I guess, and um, have the responsibility for our program globally. Great, thank you. And as you can see, uh, Troop D is representing the red team today, Becky representing the blue team in Sharon as our resident CISO, the blend of red team and blue team. Uh, I happen to be wearing orange because my world lives in the software security world where I try to educate, build teams on things like red team activities. So uh, this is the colors of cybersecurity. So with that, let me, take a moment just to share with you a little bit about ICMCP and our agenda. So hopefully you can see, yes, you can. Um, ICMCP offers uh, on a monthly basis, a number of engagement programs for its members. And these are designed uh, to highlight, uh, develop and grow uh, the diverse talents within cybersecurity. So as you can see here uh, today, we've got three very accomplished professionals. Uh, we'll be talking about um, career spotlights. You know, what's, what does the day in the life of a red teamer look like, a blue teamer look like, and how do you put them all together? But there are other ICMCP engagement topics such as career development, uh, transitions, leaderships, and then tech talks. So we encourage you to check out icmcp.org and sign up for any and all of the engaged programs that you like. We do try to align them uh, with appropriate themes. Uh, for example, uh, March being uh, Women's History Month, uh, February being uh, African American Heritage Month, et cetera. So you know, we have a number of programs coming up that represent um, those types of, uh, of programs. Um, so uh, I think I had the wrong slide set up as I was talking to that. So I'll try that one more time. There we go. Is that better? Can you see the engage programs? Now? All right. Thank you. <laughs> so as I just voiced over everything, here is the supporting slideware for that. ICMCP.org uh, and please sign up for all that you're interested in. So today's agenda, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you have any questions, you, there should be a raise your hand icon 
uh, in your Zoom webinar interface. Uh, we do have moderators standing by to answer the questions if they can or queue them up for our experts at the end. Uh, we just went through the introductions and now for the main event, uh, I'm going to be asking our panelists a series of questions and they will discuss and debate them. And then at the end, I will ask each one of our panelists to address the audience in what we call the final word, hopefully in 10 words or less, just leaving uh, our audience with uh, a bit of wisdom. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about red team and purple team. And Becky, if you please, I'll start with you. Uh, so purple teaming is something, it can mean many things, everything from conducting joint assessments, red team, blue team exercises, you know, to you know, attack and defend war games, you know, just you know, to you know, become more aware of threats. Uh, you've worked on both red teams and blue teams. So when it comes to purple teaming, uh, as shown up on the screen here, uh, how do you describe it? I would describe it as breaking down the silos between a defensive cybersecurity team and an offensive cybersecurity team. I think a lot of times we can get caught up in our day-to-day -day work and not always be connecting with each other around things that are actually really relevant and will help you improve your detection capabilities, improve your response capabilities, and doing so in such a way that's a smart way and a way that is taking risk into consideration based on what attackers are actually doing. And those attackers can be simulated by your red team. So that's what I would describe purple teaming as. Got it, got it, interesting. Now, all three of you ladies are considerably younger than I am, but I remember a movie from the 1980s called War Games with Matthew Broderick, where there was a red team that attacked and a blue team that defended, and they were simulating, um, I think, global nuclear warfare. Uh, but that's pretty much similar to what red teams and blue teams do in cybersecurity, right? Yes, uh, so. yes that's, that's about right. And yeah, I think it's probably a military term um, for a blue and red team, but we've taken it over to the cybersecurity world. So again, that defensive team, the team that's protecting is blue and the offensive team, the team that is trying to break through is red. Got it, all right. Uh, so uh, Trupti, uh, you, you recently mentioned how you were able to bring purple teaming into Illumio, um, essentially, you, teaching some offensive security tactics to build teams, basically a software development team. So talk to me a little bit about the business value that purple teaming brings. So, you know, why was that important to, you know, to bring into Illumio? Uh, absolutely. That's a great question, Ed. Uh, as Becky mentioned, uh, in earlier days, blue teams and red teams, they work in silos. Blue team kind of work with the development uh, engineering teams to implement security controls. Whereas red team, they mainly involved in penetration testing, exploitation activities towards the end of the software development or when the product is released in production. Now the business value here is no matter how much time blue team members uh, spend with development team because of other priorities and pressure of uh, you know, building and shipping the shiny new features that generate revenue, it is quite possible that 100% security due diligence is not done. And if you look at red team member, they spend their days in and out learning about new exploitation technique, vulnerability research and whatnot. So the business value of combining these two, that is creating a feedback loop between purple teaming, sorry, uh, the red teaming and the blue teaming and bringing that value to engineering community in the form of security education, where we are not only teaching them security controls, but also exploitation techniques uh, helps reduce the cost associated with bugs, security bugs detection and fixing us those security bugs. So the overall ROI uh, associated with purple teaming is way high. That's what I have seen. So that's an interesting uh, concept. You know, I've, I've been in, in the cybersecurity industry for a very long time, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and one thing that I hear often from build teams is that security is a tax. It actually slows them down and they're resistant to it because they view it in that manner. But what you're actually saying is a counter argument to that. Uh, if they adopt these type of offensive techniques, they can prevent the creation of security vulnerabilities or bugs or defects in, in the software world, which actually speeds up their process and improves the ROI of any type of security event. Did I get that right? 
uh, that's correct. Uh, we know in, in, in software industry, we need to stop looking at security or security assessment as tax, but we need to uh, start looking at them as part of quality engineering, which is extremely important for a good software development and delivery. And that's when the attitude will change and people will see the true value of uh, purple teaming and security in general. Great. Uh, Becky, Sharon, any thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe I'll just add to that. You know, I, I think there is a, there's a time period by which, you know, developers are willing to come around and say, oh yeah, let's, let's do this. This is fun. I want to do all the things that security wants us to do. And so I think that presents a little bit of the challenge, but I think a couple of the opportunities uh, come into how can we not only educate them in a, in a better way, but how can we make it easy to work with, automate as, as much as possible so they can run things themselves or uh, integrate it into their respective sprints and the like, and then work with them as they go along. Go along. And so I think those are some of the opportunities that we're looking at more and more is how do we not just leverage whatever tools that we use on, on the security side, but how do we integrate into, you know, their, their processes like into their, into, into their JIRAs, for example, and all of the different types of um, build processes that they have and enable them to do more on their side as well. And I think that's part of how we can start to bring pieces together a little bit more, but certainly it's not overnight. <laughs> for sure. I wish it was that, you know, all the development organization would wake up and say, this is a great idea. We want to invite <laughs> all day long to hang out with us. Uh, but certainly it's a journey. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would totally agree with that. I, from a software development standpoint, if you fix those bugs earlier in the process, it doesn't slow you down as much. That tax is lower. And so when you talk about return on investment, if you can start finding those bugs and start thinking like an attacker early, you will probably save yourself some time down the road. And also, I think we kind of alluded to it, but it fixes bugs. It's not just, you know, you're looking for bugs in your code all the time. It's a quality assurance issue at a certain point, but security is just another varietal. It's something else. And so you can start trying to make your code better early uh, to make sure that investment happens. And again, a lot of the ways that we've been able to kind of start that culture change and inspire people is by showing them what red teamers do, showing them what an attack looks like. You don't want to be the application team that's on the other side of the security <laughs> incident, but that's a quick way to learn exactly what an attacker is trying to do and how to make sure you need to, to change your development processes so that you're not the one who's on the other side of that incident line. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so what you ladies have been talking about is near and dear to my heart, and, and I do want to at least you know, bring up and reference this InfoSec color wheel, uh, courtesy of April Wright. Uh, for those of you that don't know April Wright, I do provide a link uh, here to uh, to her site. Uh, she's a, a terrific uh, visionary when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, and uh, and she created this uh, this particular color wheel. And we've been talking a lot about this. Uh, things like you know, security slows us down, and you both, uh, I, I think, all three of you mentioned security as an aspect of quality, which is just so warming to me because I created uh, in 2006, 15 years ago, I created a slide for, at the time, CompuWare. I was talking with their software quality um, tools division, trying to convince them that security was an important thing of software quality. And I created this, uh, this pyramid talking about uh, security as an aspect of software quality, like functionality and performance. And uh, frankly, at the time, they just didn't see it. Um, but that's a whole nother story. But uh, it sounds like we've really come a long way uh, in those 15 years, which is great. Uh, and Becky, you know, you alluded to something where um, how you get build teams uh, kind of excited or interested or engaged. And one of those ways was showing them just exactly how, you know, the systems they built are attacked. Um, you know, in my experience, you know, build teams are pretty much colorblind. They're neither red nor blue nor purple. Um, and and so, so Sharon, I'm gonna kick this question over to you because I, as, as a CISO, uh, you know, you've got interactions with, you know, other executives, with the, the board. So how do you get teams that build you know, IT systems, software applications, et cetera, how do you get them to care or get excited about security? 
How about I can get them to get excited? Let's put that one to the back burner about that. <laughs> How we do we get them to get excited about security all the time? I know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think it's been, you know, how do we get them to care a little bit more? You know, I, you're right, right on what you said. I think the, the development organization is neither red nor blue. You know, they're really looking at, you know, features, functionalities, getting those business requirements and um, helping to, you know, provide value in that regard to the business. Um, a couple of things that we've seen um, to help move them along the journey is we service a, a significant number of large companies all over the world. And we started off with them asking about, well, tell us about your SDLC processes. What are you doing there? How are you looking at security? And it's morphed into, um, we're running our own kind of programs. They even wanna test them, out, um, test them themselves to validate that what we said is in place really is in place. And so, some of that external pressure has helped to bring them along. And uh, some years back when we would just do these kinds of tests or we would just do tests and not this kind of offensive defensive perspective, you know, once a year, uh, we mm. would think that there was just so much to, to fix um, at once that it was overwhelming those teams. And so putting in processes that um, have more continual assessment and review and discussion and working better together has helped to um, help them to integrate it a little bit more and for our teams to work better together. It's still definitely a journey for us um, to having these really formal, big, you know, robust blue and red teams for sure. Um, but that's part of how we've been inspired and also working with them is to help buffer some of the, the customer pressure, helping to make it part of their processes going on. Um, as we move that program forward. Right, right. And, you know, movements like DevOps and CICD certainly, you know, accelerate that uh, urgency, I'd say, about integrating and automating as much as possible. Uh, hey, Becky, do you have any thoughts on this? I know you've kind of sat on both sides of, of, uh, of the fence, so to speak. And like Sharon, you also, you know, work for a multi-billion dollar company. I have been part of a couple culture change efforts to try to make security part of the DNA of what the technology organization is. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy. I'm not going to sit here and say it happens overnight, which I don't think anyone would. But I think trying to figure out, again, the, the business needs of the people you're working with. I mean, this is kind of a skill set for any kind of, kind of cross collaboration. You're working with people who are trying to develop a product quickly by a certain time to fit a need. And also not just that, but a reliable product. Um, we all want our applications to run and, and be available. And that's that's one of the pillars of, you know, the confidentiality, integrity, availability is availability. Reliability is a language that people understand and in the development world for sure, and especially in the operations world in the rest of your digital technology organization. And I think that's one of the pieces that I've been able to find the most common ground on. And that piece, if you, if you can kind of do a bit of a parallel, and it's a bit of a stretch, but a bit of a parallel between an outage being caused by you know, faulty code versus an outage being caused by an attack, which is caused by faulty code, you can sometimes break through a little bit. And, but it requires a lot of caring, a lot of personal connection with people and spending time. And that's not always something that we can scale. But I would say that I would agree that getting it integrated from a technology perspective as well, using you know, DevOps, DevOps includes security. If you read any book on it, it includes security. You don't have to say DevSecOps, it's just in there. You can get a good conversation going by trying to figure out how to make their lives easier, how to you know, make it not a burden. And again, that requires some investment. It's not just the people you have to change, but technology and processes. So there's a lot, a lot you have to pull in there. I love the fact that you brought in the human element of, uh, of security. Uh, it is such a critically important piece and, and a lot that I think um, some organizations don't put a lot enough em emphasis on. It's very easy to sort of invest in you know, some tooling or automation and some technology, but that human piece is, is very, very important. Um, now, we actually had a couple of questions come in from the audience, so we'll try to weave these in in real time, uh, if, if you don't mind. So, um, and I'll just kick this out there for, uh, for anyone. Um, First of all, question, uh, and I'll just read this verbatim. 
Uh, what gaps do you see when a red team does not have the tools, tactics, and procedures that a real adversary has, and they rely on tools and techniques the team is trained on? Anybody? So, um, if a red team does not have the right um, security tools, hacking tools, if they are not trained on these exploitation techniques, then for me, uh, in the absence of all this necessary thing, they cannot stimulate adversary attacks. Therefore, they are no longer a red team. And this seems like uh, somebody needs to have discussion with the chief security officer. Either there is lack of funding, skill, or talent. Uh, in the industry, there are a lot of good resources. There are a lot of good tools that can be of great help provided they have funding. So I would recommend get in touch with your CISO and explain the gap. I will maybe add to that. I agree. Uh, talk to your CISO about it um, and, and help with that business case. But I think that some of the red teaming is a little bit of an art than it is just the skill, right? And so, you know, using different types of techniques not just the ones that you know, and hey, I've got to run this and use this one tool and do this and that. You know, it's finding the, the things that maybe someone else wouldn't. And that's really the value of the red team, right? Is that they're uh, able to catch things that maybe the automation cannot. And so, you know, I think back to the point around the skills, you know, I would also encourage to look at the, the team that is, that is the red team. Are they really creative thinkers? How do you encourage that aspect of their development? Um, is that team diverse? Obviously, that's something that we push from a from ICMCP standpoint. But you know, how, uh, how what's the makeup of that team, and how do they think about things differently? Um, that can also be a nuance to the red team activities. I would 100% agree with that. One thing I love about our internal red team is that they come from a very different variety of backgrounds, and it's not necessarily the ones you'd think. And I think that that's one of the really interesting things about it is that you find people with a mindset on how to think creatively to get around controls. And those are the kind of people who are really powerful. Some of this, again, it comes down to training. It comes down to, are you gonna invest in the people that you have? Or are they gonna be willing to spend the time to invest? Um, hopefully you're, as a good leader, giving them time and opportunity and finances to improve those skills. Otherwise, you're going to be spending those finances going out to a third party who has a higher skill set. But I absolutely agree that there's there's a balance there. You have to figure out, is this the team that you need to get the job done? But honestly, a lot of teams don't even have red teams. A lot of them are you know, just trying to do it right, just trying to, to get things done. And that's probably the last step in your maturity from being, OK, for me, purple teaming is the last step. But you probably are going to not be working toward having a full-fledged red team that's can absolutely going to be able to internally simulate all of your adversaries. And even if you did, they, they probably won't. They'll do the best they can. And honestly, I would say that even a, a small red team that's focused on looking adversarially at your systems is more beneficial than no red team. And I would say that a lot of the times you're not fighting against zero days, you're fighting against the normal stuff. Um, so, I, I mean, basically do the best you can. 80% is not bad. Um, just work, work toward, you know, thinking adversarially everywhere along that process. Uh, another thing I'll add in, um, we started a, a bug bounty program at United in 2015 probably before we should have, I will say, um, but it did inspire us and it also connected us with a large amount of researchers who thought creatively around some of our public facing applications and were able to report those to us directly. Um, it's not, again, something I would recommend until your defenses and, and your software security is at a really high mature level, but it was a really great opportunity for us to see exactly what we could leverage from crowdsourcing some of that security research outside of the company. I believe we've now rebranded it to the Vulnerability Disclosure Program, but you can find out more about it on united.com. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a maturity assessment, like it or not, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. so another question from the audience, uh, again, read it verbatim. Uh, are there any tools or trainings the panelists suggest for aspiring cyber analyst to gain blue or purple team skills? I find it hard to break into uh, due to the tools and experience employers list on job descriptions and 
Uh, I'll actually start this uh, with Becky only because I know you're associated with a conference called Blue Team Con. So you might uh, want to give a shout out to that particular organization. Thanks, Ed. Yes, I am working on a conference this year that's going to be held in Chicago in the end of August called Blue Team Con. It is a conference for people who are looking to learn more about blue team skill sets. Um, however, I, I would add that just going to a conference doesn't necessarily give you the skills you need overnight. Um, some of the things that I would say to that is that you're, you're having trouble breaking in and, and not necessarily, I mean, some of the tools that people are asking for on resumes, you can't purchase off the shelf. You can't just go buy a massive SIM for yourself. Sometimes you can do some of that training online, but get creative, network around, ask people um, that you've met or that you've seen in, in certain uh, networking cir circles, you know, how did you get into this? How would I learn about this? Like make a list of all the stuff you don't know and make it start trying to figure out which ones you see more often and try to figure out where you can provide that value. I think a lot of times people are looking for experience, which is super frustrating if you're starting to start out. Um, I was very fortunate and I'll be honest to get into some internship programs really early in my career. And if you're making a mid career transition, those internship programs aren't always open to you. So trying to get a job at a really big Fortune 100 right off the bat, I would not recommend if it's a mid-year career transition. I would instead look for something that has more of a, maybe a network technology or some kind of traditional IT role that's adjacent in a smaller company. In smaller companies, you're more likely to be able to tr try different things. And you know there may not be a security person at that company and you might vol volunteer yourself to say, I'm gonna look into that and you will learn mm -hmm. so much. So again, in a larger Fortune 100, there's very specialized people that are doing very specific things in that cybersecurity field. There's so many different jobs in cybersecurity on the blue team, um, even within the red team, I'd say that there's, there's certain specialties, but in a smaller company, in a smaller organization, you are probably able to explore a little more and get creative on how to practice cybersecurity and learn those skills and experiences that you can leverage to get a job at a larger organization. Yes, yes. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention a lot of the great resources that ICMCP itself has uh, to offer to members. Um, right now, as a matter of fact, we're in the middle of a training cybersecurity uh, scholarship program made possible by Google, where we're putting over 200 members through uh, commercial red team and blue team training, pairing them with mentors, getting them career coaching. Um, and all of that is completely free to members. So uh, icmcp.org, uh, we'll mention that a couple more times, uh, but the organizations like that uh, and others uh, offer a lot of good resources to members and, and oftentimes at no additional cost. Um, okay, uh, Trupti, I want to uh, transition a little bit over to you. So uh, one thing that uh, Sharon mentioned a little bit earlier is kind of changing the way that her sort of build teams or how she engages her build teams, you know, sort of in the the earlier days, the build team and the security team were completely separate and all security testing and assessment was, was going on by the security team. And then they essentially just, you know, dump a huge you know, vulnerability report onto the, the build team that would kind of drown in it. Um, but you're a believer that development team should be knowledgeable enough about common attacks to build and ship products without necessarily the security team's direct involvement for security assessment. So you know, what, what is the issue, you know, depending on a team like Sharon's team, you know, for, uh, or, or other security experts? Um, yeah, so what I have observed over 15 years is, uh, no matter how big is your security team, they are never sufficient to fulfill the demands, uh, requirements of engineering team. Uh, engineering teams are way more larger. They build and ship product and features at a very high um, velocity. And when these security uh, teams try to intervene, do their security assessment, engineering team even feel like, uh, oh, security team is slowing us down. And not only that, they feel they are their hindrance to innovation. So therefore, you know, uh, we really need to, instead of saying shift left, start at left. Um, you know, when security team approach uh, engineering teams, development teams with pen test report with a lot of bugs, they don't like it. Nobody likes uh, calling their baby ugly, right? How about security team approach engineering teams with 
uh, training, security training, not just controls, but exploitation techniques and kind of empower them with all the knowledge they need way early, even before a single line of code is written. How about development team, once having that knowledge, start creating security requirements, start doing security story time, uh, start doing you know threat modeling with the help of uh, security team. So that is way more effective. And uh, it is this type of the style of changing security culture uh, has been more welcome into engineering teams. That's why I feel, uh, you know, we need to do that. That's great. And I like that you're talking about security story time. Yes. Uh, I mean, that, that's just great. What a, what a great phrase. Uh, I, I remember years ago, Microsoft created a card game, like a physical card game, I think it was called Escalation of Privilege, and you could download and print the cards yourself. But the whole idea was to get development teams thinking about threat modeling in a fun, engaging kind of way. Um, and I think you can still download Escalation of Privilege, but that's that security story time, right, that, that you're talking about. That's, that's pretty cool. I like that. Um, uh, Becky, next uh, question to you. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. We had one more question that came in. Uh, from the audience, since it's on red teaming specifically, and Tripti was just talking, let me fire it in there. Okay, the question is, while performing the red team operations, what if the core data is accidentally removed? I mean, that happens, right? Um, being an offensive security, there might be such an issue while trying to manipulate the various security tools. Anyone could say the only measure is to back up the data, but that is the conventional measure only, I feel. Any advanced measures are there to sort out this kind of issue? So hopefully I did that question justice. I think I did. Um, ideas, uh, Becky, I saw you nodding. Oh, no, please. <laughs> if, I, if I could solve that problem, I would, I would be great. Um, That's right. I think, I think the best you can do is hire trained professionals who know what they're doing and ask as many questions as possible before you do an exercise. Um, this is something that you you constantly have to battle and again if you lose that trust as a red team you will have a very hard time getting it back um digging out of a a deficit of trust is not an easy thing to do so you have got to make sure that that team is extremely responsible and extremely professional with asking for what is in scope for what they are allowed to do with what they are, are allowed to touch with what is production data because sometimes you think you're in a a QA environment and it's a production data. So you need to make sure that those teams are extremely, extremely professional and do their work and are not reckless. Because if they are reckless, especially in a intense operational environment, certainly in airline, they're not gonna be able to be invited back, no matter how good the results are that they find. So exactly. I would say I would say that the conventional measure of backing up the data is a very good one. Um, again, just doing precautions, don't don't mess up is, I mean, don't be, um, you know, don't do a script kitty kind of attack on things that are in production. If this is data you trust, be very cautious. That is my best advice there. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it uh, almost creating a service level agreement uh, between either an external vendor or even an internal red team where, you know, you're asking those questions about, you know, do we need to test in a maintenance window? Are we testing production data? what tests are allowed and disallowed, destructive test or non-destructive test, et cetera. Um, so that, that type of service level agreement, I think internal service level agreements are very powerful things. We also had done requests for change in the past. So we follow the change management process. We thoroughly outline a test plan. Um, mm -hmm. We've done a lot, especially when you get into the aviation space, things are extremely fragile. So you and, have to uh, be very, very careful there. I would like to just add to what Becky and Ed said. Um, I would strictly constrain uh, red teaming activities to a separate isolated uh, environment, which is either replica of uh, staging or even production. In that way, there is no spillover. Great, thank you, Tripti. Okay, next question uh, for, for you, Sharon. Uh, so as a CISO, uh, you live in a full spectrum techno color every single day, right? <laughs> There's red, blue, green, all sorts of colors in your world. Uh, it feels like, at least to me, that uh, the, the red team of hacking stuff is sort of, you know, well known. Um, but uh, you know, many ICMCP members and, and other folks might not be aware that there are other jobs in cybersecurity uh, that they may be less familiar with. So, can you talk a little bit about some other roles in cybersecurity? 
Oh, well, there's there are tons, right? Um, but maybe a couple that are related to this. I mean, I think there is at the core of it, while we're looking at attackers and defenders, we're also needing to look at um, the group that establishes those controls, those policies, those procedures. And those, um, they can be analysts. You can you never forget. I always think that the GRC related resources, risk analysts, governance analysts, those kinds of individuals are, are overlooked when we talk about security. But I think that they're so significant in that they establish those guidelines and say, well, here's the, uh, the set of controls or the kind of established um, leading frameworks that help guide what needs to be done as, as a standard. Because generally people will say, well, I asked this person or PCI, we get this often, PCI says this, NIST says this, ISO says that, why well, did this? Do I have to do the rest of it, right? And so, being able to to uh, drill that down is so significant. So, I would talk. I would definitely um, mention the analysts um, and that space in GRC, especially within risks. Um, the the architecture groups, those who are architects, are also very significant. I think it was mentioned earlier um, about the idea of threat modeling and being able to think critically about what are the possibilities of attack or vulnerability within an application or within an environment. You could start again running tools all day long, but if you don't know that it doesn't have these other layers in front of it from a control standpoint or a layering from a, um, from a model standpoint, then you may overlook something that is you know, really simple, right? So if you have an application that's facing the internet versus one that may be in your DMZ or one that may be tucked into your internal networks. You know, all of those things are significant. And so that architecture is, is um, fairly significant as well. And I would maybe add lastly, I mean, I'm not saying that everybody's not important. Everybody's important in security, it's great. Um, <laughs> well, maybe I'll add two more. Uh, one, I, uh, another group I always think is overlooked are those that are doing the documentation and the, and the technical writing. You know, it's one thing for you to be able to, um, you know, again, use all the tools in the world, but if you can't graphically understand how things are laid out, what's connected to what, so those who deal with asset management and change management and those components, so significant um, in terms of how that may affect the vulnerability of the application and what it may be susceptible to. And my last group, of course, uh, other resources is for sure, incident response and management. Um, inevitably something's going to go wrong. You know, in the, in the case of the question that was raised um, before, if you had some data and you just made it disappear, right? You know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's an incident, something we, we need to be able to address quickly and understand what all has happened. And so in an incident response or incident management type of situation, it, you can gain so much efficiency in, in time spent um, remediating or at least finding out what's happened if you understand the architecture, you understand where the potential vulnerabilities are, uh, you understand what the controls are, what was missing, it helps understand what potentially happened, uh, how can you uh, contain it, and how can you fix it going forward. So I think all of these groups, and you know, I like that um, the InfoSec wheel, all of those groups really are significant space, and it requires everybody to come together to bring their skills. Um, but each one of the each one of the groups, especially the red and the blue, are are really significant in helping to round out that picture. Yeah, agreed. And I know you, you're a big fan of standards. Um, I, I think standards are a great stepping stone for organizations to get into, or individuals to get into cybersecurity because they do play such a critical role in many enterprises. And whether it is PCI or it's ISO or it's one of the NIST frameworks. Um, and one of my particular uh, favorites is the NICE framework that NIST uh, published. Uh, it's the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, if I got that right, Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does is it defines 52 unique work roles in cybersecurity, and it documents all of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that one needs to be successful in those 52 work roles. So if you do want to understand uh, what some of those work roles are, uh, all of it is freely available on the NICE website, which uh, I have no idea what the URL is, but uh, we'll look it up and try to post it in the chat window here. Uh, so, uh, Troop D or Becky, anything to add uh, to what Sharon just said? 
Um, I, I would say as uh, the security industry is evolving, uh, there is a big shift. There are a lot of internship opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities for security focused developer to come join security forces to do security automation. Uh, then, uh, you know, we have seen a great uh, movement of shifting from private data center to uh, cloud-based uh, enterprise applications. So there is a huge need of cloud security engineers. So yeah, uh, wherever the technology goes, uh, we need security to secure it. Right, right. So, so we have another audience question, and this will be a two-part question since it came from the same person. Uh, first, where does identity and access management fit in? Uh, and secondly, where in cybersecurity does asset management fall? I'll try to jump in on this one and add a couple more career paths <laughs> while we're at it. Um, identity and access management, so managing, you know, who a person is and what role do they play at that company and what things do they have access to? And, you know, are they our are they who they say they are, um, are very important roles, um, very key roles for that. It does fit into cybersecurity. In our, in our company, it reports to the Chief Information Security Officer. Um, it is a really key part of your security program, giving you a kind of centralized way to manage people. When people leave, they lose access to things. There's a lot of different reasons why identity and access is really key to your cybersecurity program. Um, so that's definitely a piece that I would certainly say is another role and another path um, sometimes they have development skills, sometimes they have business analyst skills, um, trying to connect, you know, who, who, what should the pilot have access to? That's not necessarily a developer skill set, it's more of a, a communication skill set. I will say that technical writing, if you can do it well, you will be very successful in your career, no matter where you land in cybersecurity or in digital technology. Super great skill set and being able to concisely send out technical information to the understanding of the audience is a gift and absolutely something that we will always look for in people who come to work for us. Um, the asset management team, I think in some organizations it can fall under the greater technology organization. Uh, we actually have a cyber asset management liaison that sits underneath the cybersecurity organization who, who works really closely with that team to help get the data that the incident response team might need to respond to a certain event or the vulnerability management team might need to understand the infrastructure vulnerability on a server and what it impacts. I think the asset management is always up there at the top when it comes to critical security controls. You can't protect what you don't know, what you don't understand. And asset management is going to be key no matter where you are. And sometimes you can't fully rely on your colleagues in the asset management team to understand why it's so important to cybersecurity. So we definitely have found value in having that, that liaison to the asset management team that sits under cybersecurity and can help kind of advocate for the information and the data that they need to do their job well. Other jobs in cybersecurity that I can think of, I mentioned the vulnerability management team. Um, they work a lot on trying to find application vulnerabilities and infrastructure vulnerabilities. Um, so things like patching, things like out-of-date software, and things like you know, cross-site scripting or SQL injection. Um, they're looking to kind of find those and also aggregate that data for the application owners so that they know what the risks are on those applications and how they should start prioritizing it. And we also have governance. I mean, we mentioned GRC, uh, governance, risk, and compliance. Um, so many jobs over there, a lot around data protection. Um, GDPR has made that a huge role. Um, they work very closely with our legal team when it comes to privacy. There's all sorts of jobs that are there. Um, we mentioned, I think Tripti mentioned the cloud security team. So again, if there's more technology, you need to be able to protect it. Um, my team handles a lot of the operational technology and infrastructure sorry, the ICS systems um, to try to make sure that we protect those as well. So whatever technology you have, you have to figure out how you're going to protect it. And you may need someone who's more specialized. Uh, but there's also all sorts of analyst roles that you need to just get things done. Um, cybersecurity awareness is something that's really helpful and also a really great way to break in. Um, if you're passionate about cybersecurity and helping teach people you know, people security is a huge effort. It's it's a culture change. It's a very different hat than a maybe in-depth technical architect, but it's something that's very important. And how you are able to communicate that again to different audiences um, is another very important part of your program. But um, it's just it's just maybe not as well known as some of the other roles that we've talked about. But 
There are so, so many. I do strongly encourage you all to research what those are and how they align with your values and your skill sets and what you want to do for a living. Um, it's something I, I always hear people come to me saying, oh, I want to be an ethical hacker. I want to wear a hoodie and hack things. And, and that's only one role. There are so many more. So please, please, please um, spend some time with your network, with the people that you know, learning about what opportunities are out there. And um, the more you come with a clear vision of where you want your career to go, especially when you're starting out, the better. And I'll add maybe one last thing to that. What we do at ICMCP, we've also made available uh, to our members a tool called Competency Core that enables our members to go in and say, hey, I'm interested in being an analyst in line with the NICE framework that Ed mentioned. And you know, asking questions about, do you have this kind of skill or that kind of skill? And it maps to that nice framework. And it helps you to understand what kind of gaps you may have to getting to the role that you are looking for. And then we can work with you to develop the kind of a training and development plan to get there. And that's super significant, especially those who are uh, mid-career transitioners, as Becky mentioned earlier, you don't have to always start from zero, right? You have some tangible skills that you've acquired um, that are useful within cybersecurity and being able to translate that or understand how that translates into the roles that you uh, want to have become really, really significant. So I would encourage um, all of our members and if you're, again, icmcp.org to go uh, for uh, new membership, but for those who are members to leverage Competency Core and do that analysis, that gap assessment for yourself uh, to get to the roles that you're interested in. Thank you, uh, all three of you. Uh, terrific, terrific information for, for all of our listeners. And um, yeah, a rainbow doesn't have nearly as many colors as we need for cybersecurity. There are just so many different jobs. And, uh, and I really appreciate you all you, uh, taking the time to uh, help educate our listeners on that. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, I'm going to pass off to Troopty. And Troopty, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I wanna reference something that um, Gartner brought up. Um, you mentioned the shifting left or actually starting left uh, previously. Um, this is from a report that Gartner published last year called Three Steps to Integrate Security into DevOps. And what they're saying is we should be shifting left and right. And my question to you is, you know, what do you think about this? Is it even possible? Like, is Gartner just you know, spewing more best practice from you know, their ivory tower, so to speak? Uh, what, what do you think about shifting left and right when it comes to security and particularly in uh, a DevOps and CI/CD world, which is a world that you've lived in very recently. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for showing that picture. Uh, if you look at uh, any organization uh, who are just starting their information security program, because of compliance and regulation, uh, penetration test by independent third party is must. That's why any organization, when they start their cybersecurity program, they always start uh, at right. And over the time that they realize, oh, this is not sufficient. External pen tests uh, are expensive and uh, we usually do way late in SDLC or when things are in production. So we need to slowly start uh, shifting uh, towards left. And people think about rolling out tools so that they get integrated in CI CD pipelines and tools take care of the low hanging um, issues, but they don't necessarily find the creative uh, problems mm -hmm. Sharon mentioned, a uh, pen testers are capa capable of finding. Then they realize, oh, just rolling out tools is not sufficient. We need to do something more than that. Then they shift further left. They start introducing design architecture reviews from security point of view, security story time and threat modeling. So it's a very natural uh, evolution. But now that we have so many resources already available and we have talked enough times about this, I personally believe uh, that when you're creating uh, security at right, start thinking about the left and actually start from left. Well, how about a training program that can educate not only developers, QA engineer, IT, uh, but also product manager, PMOs, uh, directors, and VP as well. So start from left and uh, make sure you weave security throughout the SDLC and instead of focusing on right and left. Th that's what I feel. Got it. 
yeah, easier said than done, but uh, I, yes. I absolutely agree. It is, uh, there's many steps in, in any type of build process. Uh, okay, uh, Sharon, next question to you. Uh, and this uh, is really kind of alluding toward that holy grail, right? Measuring ROI and, and security, right? It's what every executive wants, right? I'm, I'm a CEO, I'm a pain on the butt. I always ask about ROI for any type of investment. But when it comes to security, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, I'm also a security professional, so I wear two hats uh, in that respect. But um, it is um, virtually impossible with security to quantify ROI, or at least maybe, you know, I, I'm just uh, a skeptic on that. But as a leader, as a security leader, what steps do you take to ensure that you've got the budget that you need to do your job? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And, and you know, I think I might be alone on this on how you calculate ROI, but you you, you do all of the standard certifications and they'll tell you, you know, you have to look at this measure and grab this measure and then, you know, and that's how you determine ROI. You know, okay. Uh, <laughs> but for us, the way we, how I go about um, going after budget is number one, understanding what are, what are our gaps? Um, I take a couple of different things to, to figure that out. Number one, we, um, as part of our process, we have a customer security team that responds to all the customer RFPs, RFIs when we're going after new business. And really over the last couple of years, we've answered nearly 20,000 questions from our customers. Um, and that is just really rich data. And so what that enables us to do is to say, by industry, here are the kinds of things that they're asking us about that we don't have answers for, or that we have gaps in what we're doing from a program standpoint. That resonates with our executive management team because they understand, hey, if I'm interested in going after this segment or this demographic of customer and they're asking about these things, it'll be either greater or um, easier or harder to win them on, you know, from a security standpoint in that regard. So taking in kind of the customer perspective of, of that. Then of course, as, as we've been talking here about the gaps and vulnerabilities within our environment, what are we seeing? What are we not covering? Do we have enough um, efforts in, for example, cloud, or as we transition to those types of things, uh, taking those components and saying, you know, here are the other pieces that we need to fill in. And then, of course, the, the third, third slash fourth component is, you know, legal regulatory pressures as well. So we have operations in 100 countries, over 100 countries. And so you think about every kind of country that wants to pop up with a new something or other, or a new state that wants their own special privacy related something or other, you know, taking into all of those factors and saying, hey, we are or not compliant or meeting these re requirements here or there. Here are the things that we need to, to be mindful of. So putting all of those together um, and saying, here are the things that, uh, here's how we can prioritize them um, in phases or in all in one year, which no one really has the even if you got all the budget, I don't know if anybody has the strength to lift all of that stuff in one year. Um, but here are the things that we need to go about to, um, investing in. But then also, I think one thing for just general CISOs need to understand is that asking for budget does not happen during budget season, right? So it comes along with having the conversation with a, an ally or a peer or having as many people say that these things that you're thinking of are important. So for example, in this red team, blue team conversation, um, not just having, hey, I think we need to do these things to help drive efficiencies for um, our, our DevOps team, but having the leader of DevOps say, this is important, we need to some greater efficiencies and having you know, a customer or a program, uh, program manager say, hey, because you did this and we were able to respond so much faster, it had this kind of impact from a customer standpoint. So as many people either can talk about it or can share um, whatever needs to be done so that they're selling in advance or planting seeds in advance help to make the case a little bit um, easier to pitch. But no, I, I definitely disagree with the approach of a CISO walking in and asking for millions of dollars when in front of your executives and they've never heard of it and they don't understand why they need to do it. I don't think that that's effective yeah. at all. So, <laughs> you know, that's about, that's how we go about looking at how to acquire the budget and then how to also prioritize what's important for our business. 
Yeah, it, it's an ongoing conversation that that never happens because things are always changing. And that actually uh, relates to something, you know, Becky, you mentioned earlier about asset management. Um, essentially, you know, it, it's about the attack surface that you're you're trying to manage and monitor. And and that this is an emerging um, solution area for some vendors, you know, enterprise attack surface uh, monitoring. And it's not something that you know, was on most CISOs radars you know, last year or even the year before. So it's probably not in this year's budget. So you've always got to have that kind of conversation going on you know, to make sure that you're staying on, on top of all of these emerging trends. Um, okay, so we've got five minutes left. Uh, what I'd like to be able to do uh, is transition to the final word and then we've got one or two slides to wrap up for ICMCP member benefits. So uh, Trupti, I'll start with you and then I'll roll to Becky and Sharon, uh, I'll have you bring us home. So the final word in 10 words or less, if you can, please leave our audience with one last piece of advice. Tripti, please. Collaboration is the key. Do not work in silos. And you nailed it. That's less than 10 words. <laughs> well done, well done. Becky, please. No matter what team you're on, think like an attacker. All right. <laughs> Love it. And Sharon. I was like, if I just combine there too, does that count? Um, <laughs> I, I think everyone has a role to play um, and do your role the best to the best of your ability. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, now let me wrap up with a couple of slides about ICMCP for those that might not be familiar. Uh, so, <clears throat> Um, and hopefully you can see ICMCP member benefits screen. Yes, someone nod. Yes, okay, thank you, great. Uh, can never make sure I get the screen sharing right. Uh, so for ICMCP uh, benefits, uh, it is open to everyone. ICMCP is a completely inclusive organization. Membership is presently free and there are many benefits that you can get by becoming a member. Uh, Sharon mentioned uh, Competency Core, which is under the success pillar here allows you to self-assess against the NICE framework that we referenced to determine what your job-ready skills are. But we also have a job sport that we'll be relaunching soon. We have access to CyberSeq, so you can explore various cybersecurity roles. Um, what you uh, are hearing here is the ICMCP Engage program, which is part of our development of educational webinars. We also have a series of scholarships. We mentioned earlier that a cybersecurity training scholarship made possible by Google, but there are other cash scholarships. There are scholarships that uh, will support industry certifications, et cetera. Either free or deeply discounted training from commercial training providers. Uh, we've got nine of them presently. We also have a very active mentor protege program. Uh, and then of course we have a very robust membership that uh, we can connect you with. Uh, so you can talk with like-minded uh, professionals uh, you can get connected with uh, existing professionals, get some career coaching, go through mock interviews, uh, participate in resume writing workshops, et cetera. Uh, and just in case you're interested in some of our upcoming events, we've got two more happening this quarter. On Saturday, July 24th, in just a few days, uh, our Texas chapter is leading an interview series with uh, folks from Jack Henry, the NHISAC, and CACI International. And then on the 29th, there is a webinar being presented by Google, Security Policy Management as a Hot Skill. Yes, really, I uh, love that title. And you can sign up for any of these on icmcp.org slash icmcp calendar, uh, which is right on the screen there. With that, we are right on time. We've answered all of our, in, uh, our questions from our audience and I would like to thank all of you for your generosity with your time and your wisdom. Sharon, Becky, Trupti, you're very much appreciated and thank you for sharing. Thank Have a great day, all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.